Okay, quick video that I've been promising for quite a while now, and I'm just getting around to doing it, on Gustav Stresemann and the economy. But just before I begin, a uh, quick shout-out for some Year 10s who've asked for shout-outs. So shout-out here to Harry, to Shakira, uh, to Evie, to Jess, to Ella, to Sophie, to Joe, and to the other Evie, both Evies. Uh, so a big shout-out to you guys. Thank you for watching. Hope you are anyway, because it'll help you with your understanding of Stresemann, who we've obviously just been looking at not too long ago. Go. So, Gustav Stresemann, he is an, he's a really, really crucial figure. He is a figure who you really do need to know about as part of the Germany course, just as much as other significant figures in, in, in the course. Um, so, there are two key areas, really, that you need to know about for, for Gustav Stresemann. Um, basically, his domestic work, particularly with the economy that, vid that this video is going to be um, talking about, his work with the economy, but also um, his work as Foreign Secretary, too. Um, and, as I say, this video is going to focus on, on his work with the economy. Now, the, the first major economic... Um, breakthrough for Stresemann, or first big um, achievement for Stresemann um, with the economy, is currency reform, uh, bracket the Rentenmark, uh, 1923, which I'll talk about now. So, if you cast your mind back um, to Germany in the early 1920s, um, there was a huge issue with hyperinflation. Uh, essentially, if you remember about the hyperinflation, the German mark is essentially worthless. Um, so what Stresemann does to combat this issue of hyperinflation and the, and the mark being worthless was he scrapped that currency, got rid of it, uh, the German mark, and he replaced it with a new temporary currency, emphasis on the temporary, a new temporary currency called the Rentenmark. Okay. Now the Renton mark, the basic, the reason why the Renton mark worked as a currency was its value was based on Germany's industrial and agricultural worth. Um, and the amount that was printed as well was very tightly controlled. Obviously, that's been the problem with the previous mark. That's why we've ended up with hyperinflation in Weimar Germany in the early 20s, because the printing of the money has got out of control. So the, um, the control of the printing of the Renton mark is, uh, it was very tightly controlled. Um, so the chance of another hyperinflation crisis occurring um, is drastically reduced as a result. Uh, Stresemann even promised, and this was a great measure as well, he even promised that um, if the Renton mark failed, that he would exchange the Renton mark notes for shares in German land or German industry, um, which obviously gave people a lot, a lot more confidence with this currency, thinking, well, this, this currency is strong and it's, it's not going to fail and it's going to work. Um, so that was a really, really uh, clever move. Another clever move that Stresemann came up with and introduced was the Reichsbank. Now, the Reichsbank was a national centralised bank which monitored or controlled uh, the German currency. So the Reichsbank essentially keeps an eye and keeps control of the, um, of the currency. Uh, again, to avoid the situation of um, you know, the currency getting out of control, um, as happened with the previous mark and with the hyperinflation. Now, in 1924, so a year later, after the Renton mark, the right mark was introduced to replace the rental mark as the new permanent currency of, of Germany. Um, and again, this helped reassure the, um, the German, reassure the German public and the international, um, people, the international community, um, that the German economy was recovering and it was stable. Um, so this actually helped influence, um, several people, both, as I say, inside Germany and outside Germany, that the economy was strong and other countries would therefore trade with Germany or be more likely to trade with Germany because you're not really going to trade, if you're, if you, I don't know, America or whoever, you're not really going to trade with a country if you think, well, their economy's, you know, very, very delicate and could go at any point because, you know, you may end up losing a huge amount of money yourself. Because the German economy was now strong, or appeared to be strong anyway, people were much more likely to trade with Germany as a result and that also strengthened the economy. So it was a nice little um, circle, really. In the same year, 1924, the same year as the uh, Reichsmark, there was the Doors Plan, okay? Now, the Doors Plan, as I say, 1924, uh, involved US banks investing in German industry. 
Um, and also, as part of that Dawes plan, they reduced the annual payments of reparations. So Germany is still paying reparations. That doesn't change. Um, but the amount they pay per year is reduced as part of this Dawes plan, which you know naturally is a is a big help to uh, the German economy because less money is um, is leaving the country, and um, you know they've got more money to invest in themselves, basically. Um, as well as that, the French also agreed to withdraw uh, from the Ruhr. If you remember, as part of the um, the previous crisis with hyperinflation and not paying the reparations, the French and the Belgians had occupied the Ruhr in Germany, um, a region in Germany where um, a lot of German industry was based, specifically coal and things like that, and they'd been taking German coal and German machinery and German production um, to pay the reparations. They agreed to withdraw from the Ruhr region, um, which, you know, again, that's a huge uh, win for the um, for Germany because, you know, this... Um, in a sense, invading force uh, has now left, and um, you know that obviously goes down very well with the German population in particular. Now, all of these measures, with the Doors Plan um, and with the Rental Mark as well, led to, and the Reichsmark, I should say, uh, led to Germany's industrial output doubling because, again, German the, there's been investment in German industry, so their industrial output doubles. Uh, there was therefore an increase in expo- imports and exports because Germany are able to export more things that they are making and therefore pay for more things to import. Um, there was a decrease in unemployment because, again, as German industry takes off, there are more jobs available for people, uh, so a decrease in unemployment and an increase in government income, mainly from taxes. Um, you know, because people are working, therefore they've got more money so they can pay more tax, um, which, you know, the tax is paid to the government. And again, there's a nice little circle of you know money going all around. The, the German government get more money from taxes, so they invest in industry, which makes more jobs available, which gives people more jobs, gives them more money, and therefore they can pay more tax. Love a little um, synchronicity with it. Um, unemployment actually did drop to the lowest level for 10 years um, in 1928. So it was literally, the unemployment in Germany in 1928 was as low as it had been. Um, since the end of the First World War. So, um, you know, clearly things were, were, were working. This, this policy was working for, uh, for Stresemann. Um, and again, all of this um, encouraged or increased the confidence in the Allies, so Britain, America, France, etc., that Germany would repay her reparations because, as I say, German industry is doing well and Germany are making more money. Therefore, the Allies are more confident that Germany will make the payments that uh, they owe in reparations and... Um, you know, that's another good thing. Uh, however, there were some German people who really didn't like this. They saw it as Germany um, basically accepting the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, um, which, you know, clearly isn't a very popular move in Germany because they, you know, rightly see the, the Treaty of Versailles as a really, really unfair measure. Um, also, another negative is the success of the German economy um, is tied to the US economy because the US have invested a lot of money in the German economy. Clearly, if the US economy, um, you know, goes down, if, if things go wrong with the US economy, the German economy is directly tied to that. And as we know, that is exactly what happens with uh, the Wall Street crash in 1929. And finally, speaking of 1929, there was the Young Plan in 1929, which reduced the overall reparations debt. So the amount that Germany had to pay overall was reduced. And again, it reduced how much the Germans had to pay year on year, um, which naturally made it more affordable. Um, so it meant the government were able to reduce taxes because they were paying less um, less out to the, to the Allies um, to make German people's lives easier. Um, and therefore, they had more money to spend on industry again because less money is going out. So they've got more money to spend on themselves now that they weren't having to spend it on as, as much reparations. However, again, there were real negatives with the Young Plan. For starters, there were still some Germans who again saw this as, saw the Young Plan as an acceptance of the Treaty of Versailles because they're like, oh yeah, we'll agree to reduce the reparations. Well, the German public are like, you shouldn't be agreeing to this. You shouldn't be agreeing to it at all because you shouldn't have agreed to the Treaty of Versailles in the first place. Um, so therefore, that was very unpopular. On top of that, the Young Plan's effectiveness was actually very limited because in the same year, you have the Wall Street crash, which um, 
is when you know, the Americans recall the money that they have lent to Germany. So the effectiveness of the Young Plan is drastically reduced as a result of that. Um, so that's the economy under Strasman in just under 10 minutes, and the bell has just gone as well, so that's good timing. Uh, next video will be all about Strasman's work as Foreign Minister. So see you very soon. Thank you.